Hi, I'm Sandra Smiley of Médecins Sans Frontières, Doctors Without Borders, and I took a left at the valley. I know we shouldn't have to scream that we're atheists, you know, we don't have non-astrologers and all that, but with the religious people taking over the world, I mean, we can either speak up or be pushed into a corner. I'm proud to be an atheist, a skeptic, a non-believer, an infidel, a heathen, I call it how I see it. Coming at you from another set of exaggeration, this is Left of the Valley. My name is Kevin, and I once won a staring contest with my reflection. Joining me as usual is the exaggerated talent of this local atheist podcast. A bird in her hand is worth three in the bush. Nancy. Yeah, I should say cheap, cheap, or you know, for my little birdie friend. Or. <laughs> and she never wears a wash because time is always on her side. Deb, welcome back. Thank you so much. Ladies, it's always a pleasure having you with us. Oh, yeah, somebody's got to keep you in line. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for that. <laughs> Hope you had a great week. A bit of chit-chat first. Um... Apparently, uh, we've uh, had some bad news on the environmental side. Apparently, we've surpassed the 400 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Uh-oh. Yeah. Uh, you remember when they used to say 350 was you know, not supposed to pass 350? Now we've passed 400. So the, as far as global warming is concerned, it's just going to get worse and worse. So what are the ramifications when it when it goes past? Are we at, at toxic stage? Are we at critical mass? Or, or, That's a good question. What does that, what I, does that mean? Or is it just a, the warning that if it goes any higher, uh, the pollution is you know going to be part of our lives? Well, it is. I think it yeah. is now, and I think I think a lot well, of scientists you know, are starting to say, you know, we've passed the point of no return now. No matter what we do at this point, we're going to feel consequences. We we can't stop it. Well, I mean, we can reduce it, but we can't stop having an effect on the planet. Um, apparently, uh, on a lighter note, though, uh, 200 nations, and this just happened yesterday, 200 nations uh, agreed to meet and reduce the gases in the fridges and AC. Remember the uh, when we had the ozone layer thing? Mm-hmm. And they did that. They reduced the uh, hydrofluorocarbons, the HFCs. Okay. That was way back then. That's, oh, that's right. Yeah, I remember. Well, they, yeah. they, they decided to do it again, but, you know, to reduce it even more. Um, I think it's still, it's still too short, though, because apparently they're supposed to reduce by 10% by 2019 and reduce by 85% by 2036. I wonder if any of those, I mean, this is really a very naive question, but they have the summits and they have the scientists working and they set their goals. And I absolutely have no idea whether any of the goals that have been set to reduce the pollutants and the hydrocarbons and all of these have ever been met uh, on schedule. Do you, um, do you know? Some of them were met. Yeah. Uh, others were not. Um, Canada, for, unfortunately, we're in a country that is not very good at meeting its targets. And especially with our last prime minister, he really wasn't interested in doing so. Yeah. Uh, our prime minister right now seems to be more inclined to do so. So let's hope, let's see where it goes into the future. Yeah, I don't think there's any choice. I mean, it, it's. It, it, I think every year uh, the scientists say, this is a wake-up call, and everybody yeah. snoozes. We've had, it's we've a wake-up the... call, it's, and, and yet, you know, it's like... When are people finally going to realize yeah. that there, there, there is no, you know, twin planet where we can all migrate exactly. when this one finally bites the dust? It's like, it's, it's, oh, the global warming is not real. Well, geez, how come this is the warmest October ever recorded, and before that, the warmest September ever recorded, and before that, the warmest August were ever recorded, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, every freaking month. This is more than just, you know, we're having sunny weather it's 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 getting dangerous and i really really hate how they seem to be taking their sweet time why does it have to reduce by 10 percent by 2019 why does it have to take three years to get there good questions we need to have somebody on that can really delve into that because it's it's becoming you know so apparent that something has to be done and not just talk I mean, we we know from history that, you know, within six months, you know, during World War II, within six months, they switch all the factories from making cars to making tanks. Within six months. Oh, but then you're talking about the war machine, and that is exactly where you're going. What does the government want you to rely on? They're not going to tell you that we're now not going to rely on oil anymore for for our fuel. And so, therefore, we can't get any 
we can hope for 10%. I mean, if we all, if we all were denied the privilege of oil, then we could do 50%, 60%, 90% mm, even, yeah. right? Yeah. But that's not what they want. It's, it's the dollar churning machine. Mm-hmm. I just think it's too slow nonetheless. Uh, in other news, um, have you guys heard about these creepy clown trend? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what to make about this. This is so ridiculous. Well, you know, if there's anybody out there listening to us right now, don't get into that creepy clown thing. It's just stupid. Don't dress up as a clown and try to scare people. It's infantile. It's 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 almost like one of those fake panics people are manufacturing. But that's what they want. They want to be infantile and have a fake panic. You know, that's a, that's so yeah. you're now you took all the fun out of it, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> no, isn't there some place where they where Ronald McDonald d- decided not to appear because Yes. The, yes, yeah. I, I saw that. I, yeah. I didn't I don't have this uh, this information right here, but I did see that. There was a, I think a party where Ronald McDonald was yeah. Were you scared of clowns when you were a kid? No. I, I never no, was. Deb, were you afraid of clowns? I'm still terrified of clowns. Oh. They're the most ludicrous thing on the planet. That's why when she you, sits far I mean, away from me. It, when a child <laughs> is born, right? I mean, it, from from the moment they hit the ground, they're looking at faces and seeking faces out for information. And so to look at something that is supposed to be funny but has an angry face or a sad face or I'm um, supposed to be entertained, but it's it's all miscued. It's chaos, right? So I I don't like clowns. I've never understood the interest in clowns. I I find them to be terrifying myself. So what's your what's your favorite scary clown? I don't really have a favorite. Tim Curry as Pennywise the clown in uh, It for Stephen yeah. King. Come on. <laughs> Uh, weren't there several episodes on um, the Twilight Zone that had to do with scary clowns? Oh, absolutely! Too? Yeah. Yeah. Right. I don't know. That's a good question. I don't know. Yeah, oh, I yeah. think and, it, and the lighting and everything—they were just really terrifying. Right. I think the only acceptable clown that I was ever exposed to was J.P. Patches. I am a Patches kid from mm. Seattle <laughs> area, and uh, you know he had a happy face though, right? And he was full of joy. So yeah, he was. He was okay. Well, Patch Adams. Patch yeah. Adams is a good clown. Mm. He's also a doctor. Yeah. yeah. Did you guys have Bozo? We had Bozo in the we, States. We had Bozo, Bozo the clown was mm-hmm. a happy. Yeah, happy clown. That, that guy Bozo. made a zillion million dollars, I'm sure, being Bozo the clown. And, and then he could take the makeup off and go anywhere he wanted to go mm-hmm. and be, right. you know, totally you know, unrecognizable. Anonymous, yeah. yeah, it was yeah. wonderful. Some, something a bit less funny is um, without anybody really noticing, the U.S. has started bombarding Yemen. You know, they were already sending drones into there, but now apparently it's actually a There's full so battle There's so many things sheet. that we really don't want to talk about, yeah. and isn't that one of them? Shh, Maybe. <laughs> you're, you're an American, and you're an ex-American, you know, ladies. <laughs> account for your country. No, ladies. I'm a dual. I'm not an ex. I'm a, I'm a dual. <laughs> okay, that's fine. <laughs> she has I can, I, can criticize, I can criticize both sides of the border, right? You know, yeah. I, I retain that right. Yeah, and uh, does anybody have a Samsung phone Galaxy Note 7 by any chance? No. Because apparently no. they keep uh, burning and they keep <laughs> catching on fire. Yeah. So, uh, what am I hearing here? Yeah. Put out your phone, put out your phone. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> that was the news in the week, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, excellent. Nancy, my dear, are you ready to go for your usual segment? I am ready to go with my usual segment, which go. is This Day in History. Are you ready to hear the usual segment? Then go we're off. It. Okay. And we are off with the roundup of those events and people that altered and illuminated the dates between October the 10th to the 16th. October the 10th, as we all know, was Thanksgiving in Canada. I hope everybody had a wonderful Thanksgiving. And our Thanksgiving also comes at the same time as Columbus Day in the States. And Columbus used to be a pretty popular guy, but I think his popularity is definitely waning because of all of the the awful things that he did when he finally, you know, reached the the shores outside of the, the States and then began to um, uh, mistreat the in- indigenous population there. And mistreat? Indiz- you be nice? Mis- yeah. And when I was a kid, we never knew that. We thought uh, Columbus was a hero and everything we read. And then in back in 1995, this fellow named James Lowen 
wrote a book called Lies My Teacher Told Me. Are you, do you know that book? No, Kevin? I don't. That was the first, and, I mean, this is late in, in realizing how bad Columbus was, but Lies My Teacher Told, uh, Lies My Teacher Told Me exposes all of the things that Columbus did, and then he goes into other myths of so-called heroes, you know, in children's books and in, in the schools, and I think that really started the ball rolling, um, and uh, at this point, uh, being the, the Columbus Day is being replaced by Indigenous Peoples Day, sometimes called Native American Day, and it's been celebrated in a lot of localities in the states. It began as a counter celebration, um, and then uh, this year, uh, cities and states have joined the movement to rename the day and completely dispose of. Uh, Columbus Day, uh, Phoenix, Arizona, Seattle, Washington, Minneapolis, uh, San Antonio, Texas, Lincoln, Nebraska, East Lansing, Michigan, Denver and Boulder in, in Colorado, and the entire state of Vermont. That said, not everyone is on board yet, and Cincinnati, Ohio was one of those places that voted against. You think maybe it would be Columbus, Ohio that would <laughs> vote against because then they'd have to think? change their name to Indigenous Ohio. <laughs> and maybe that was too maybe that was too big a jump for them. Anyway, I'm all all in favor of having Indigenous Day and, you oh, know, yeah, get absolutely. rid of Columbus Day. It, yeah. it, it's the great the great calamity of our uh, of the of our past that is never really talked about how First Nations were treated and, by our Europeans. A- absolutely, and, th- and this finally acknowledges the, the the reality of what happened, and not just the myth, yeah. you know, to to celebrate. October the 11th is National Coming Out Day, and National Coming Out Day um, is an annual LGBTQ Awareness Day. It's celebrated on October the 11th. It was founded in the U.S. in 1988, and the initial idea was grounded in the feminist and gay liberation spirit of, uh, of, uh, of the personal, um, uh, at the emphasis on the most basic form of activism, which is coming out to family, friends, and colleagues and living a life as openly lesbian or gay person or whoever you are and just recognizing that and being able to be an authentic individual regardless of your sexual orientation. And you could still uh, use that advice for being an atheist as well. Exactly. Well come on exactly. It's, it's like a human right yeah. instead of a gay right. Um, and the foundational belief is that homophobia thrives in an atmosphere of silence and ignorance, and that once people know that they have loved ones um, who are lesbian or gay, they're far less to maintain homophobic or oppressive views. You can only hope that it's still, <laughs> unfortunately, but yeah. I think it's getting better. I, I think the recognition definitely is. Oh, yeah, it is. is. It is. It totally is getting better because as I compare just from 20 years ago when I was a kid, no, absolutely. Yeah. Um, this year, Yom Kippur, the Jewish Day of Atonement, and uh, Ashura, which. Is that the one where they swing the chicken? Pardon? Is that the one where they swing the chicken over the head? Yeah. Oh my God. Where did that come from? Oh man, I have no idea. But the 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 um, uh, the background of it is that when well, Yom Kippur is the Day of Atonement when you get rid of all of the bad things that you did yeah, you and you start the, the slate. You start the slate clean. So you apologize to anybody that you may have offended. And I think the swinging over the head of the chicken was a middle European, a mid European thing of transferring all of the bad things that you haven't confessed to yet or didn't know, you transfer all of it to the chicken. If you use a bucket <laughs> of KFC, does that work? <laughs> it's a, I it's guess tasty, it's, Sam. Yeah, I would have. <laughs> I'll have to, we'll have to look that up. And <laughs> it's a good thing I'm not Jewish. I'd be sweet we'll chicken to, forever. I'll have to find a rabbi and ask him if you can. A lifetime mulligan I guess I, but is it kosher? buffalo chicken wings. There we go. But <laughs> the main thing is, is it kosher? <laughs> yeah, because of kosher chicken, right? Yeah, it's got to be a kosher fried chicken. So I have to. That's a, that's. A, I'll have to look that one up. Good humor. Good humor. <laughs> <laughs> okay, in, on October the, I think we got everything out of that <laughs> that chicken that we that we could. 1922, and you know how Kevin, you know how much I love people's names. If if yes, something has a good name, I don't care what the story is. It's the good name. 1922, Alaska Packard Davidson. There we go. You, I name. love that name. Alaska Packer Davidson became the first female special agent at the age of 54. And she only served for two years, and then she was asked to resign by newly appointed 
J. Edgar Hoover, unfortunately, because he wasn't too fond. Probably sold her dress, too. Yeah, that's, probably that's why. <laughs> I think you could ring the bell. I like that She one. just came in the office one day wearing the same thing he wore. Right. Like, you know what? One of us has got to go. And she looked better at it. It was <laughs> tough. <laughs> anyway, it wasn't until 1970. Yeah. Hoover had to die, and then in 1972, once the dress was gone, in the passing of the Equal Employment Opportunity Act, that she was again, uh, you know, that not she, but women could again join the forces of the FBI. But what a great name, Alaska Packer Davidson. It's just, it, you could be president with a name like that. I'll just say that with FBI at the end. Yeah. What was it, Alaska? Packer Davidson. Alaska Packer Davidson FBI. Yeah, there I know. There's, like, there's a, yeah, there's a series. Please. There's, a, me, se- there's a series there. Uh, 1984, Catherine Sullivan became the first U.S. woman to walk in space aboard the Challenger. Um, and in 2004, there was a mini series called The Brief History of Disbelief with Bernard Hill, Jonathan Miller, and some guy named Richard Dawkins. Who is that guy? I have no I idea. No, what happened? Anyway, there were three episodes on YouTube. You can still pull them up, but I've never seen them. <laughs> I have no idea, but I'm going to have to take a peek and yeah, see absolutely. what that's like. October the 12th, Free Thought Day in the States. Um, and on Free Thought Day, another woman. This Wait, is the, do we really want free thought again in the States? I mean, we're, uh, I know we're you not guys doing. are capitalists, but you can't charge for thinking. No. Wow. <laughs> It's almost terrifying at this point. I'm sorry. I'm, a, I'm, I'm maybe a little shell shocked at this point. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good thing in concept. Let's, let's, let's do the concept. Yes. So this is a, this is the um, the trifecta. This is the third woman, you know, in a, in a couple of days that we're we're going to celebrate. But she was the first, 1799. Janine would it be Janine Genevieve Lambros? Lambros? Yeah. Okay. Was the first woman? I did good, huh? The first woman to jump from a balloon with a parachute from an altitude of 900 meters. And she was a wife of a balloonist, and um, he, he invented the frameless parachute. And uh, she first flew on the 10th of November in 1798, the year before. She was one of the earliest women to fly in a balloon and subsequently became the first to ascend solo and then the first woman to make a parachute descent in a gondola from the uh, from the 900 meters and that was the 12th of October and she nice. filed a patent for her husband's parachute how exciting <laughs> nice. it's exciting 1892 the pledge of allegiance was first recited by students in many U.S. public schools. I never understood that. And ironically enough, this is this is why I, I included. This is very ironic. The Pledge of Allegiance was first a part of a celebration marking the 40, 400th anniversary of Columbus's voyage. Oh, the Isn't irony. that wild? Yes. That's just wild. Yeah. Anyway, 17, uh, 1979, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy was the first of the five books in um, by Douglas Adams for The Hitchhiker. Uh, and the then, answer is 42. Yeah. October the 15th, Teacher's Day in Brazil. And um, it was a publication of a short history of atheism uh, by Galvin Hyman, which traced the route by which modern epistemological discussion produced atheism. So if anybody would like, here's the title. i got to take a deep breath with okay. this title. Here we go. The Predicament of Postmodern Theology, Radical Orthodoxy, or Nihilistic Textualism. Wow. wow. Man, you can curl Say up with that, that one. Say that ten times fast. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> And anyway, that, dear listeners, brings to a close another passing parade of interesting, mundane, unusual, and occasionally bizarre events and people that make up this day in history. Yes, uh, another <laughs> interesting <laughs> bit of uh, history, for sure. We learn so much on the show, don't we? I know. You know, the, the, when I first did this, I th- when we first started this, I thought, oh, it's going to be a drudge kind of going through, you know, the history. But you learn so so much there's these little gems and you, it's like being a student of, of history and I, I never was a really good student of history but I've become one well you made us all better history. students of history Nancy. <laughs> thank you so much fun. <laughs> and we'll be right back right after this hi I'm the Supreme Irreverend Dr. Randy Tyson from the Legion of Reason Diversion. 
Join me and my co-hosts, Christine Shelska, Twyla, and Nate Phelps, as we explore issues at the intersection of atheism, humanism, and skepticism. Topics range from alternative medicine to the interference of religion in public policy. We often have special guests to help us understand the topic du jour. Previous guests include biologist Jerry Coyne, ex-Muslim author Ali Rizvi, philosopher Peter Bogosian, and the late physicist Victor Stanger. You can watch us on the Legion of Reason YouTube channel or subscribe to the audio version through your favorite podcatcher such as iTunes or Stitcher. And don't forget to like the Legion of Reason Facebook page. What is secular humanism? Critical thinking. Knowledge is freedom. Freedom from ignorance and its offspring, fear. The BC Humanist Association has been active in the Vancouver area for over 25 years. We offer a friendly and welcoming place to make new friends, as well as free educational lectures. We invite you to join us any Sunday at 10 a.m. in the Oak Ridge Senior Center. Please visit our website for more details at bchumanist.ca. And we're back. Today we're going to be talking about the plague of women, uh, the struggles for women in uh, the area in the Middle East, especially Saudi Arabia. For that, we have our old friend, Anthony Avis Dubuisson. Anthony, welcome back. Oh, I'm glad to be back, Kevin. <laughs> oh, we're glad to have you back. Yes, absolutely. Last time, uh, I know you, you did a fantastic show with us last time, but for some of our audience that might not have heard who you are, mm -hmm. would you be so kind to give us a Reader's Digest of who Anthony uh, is? Okay. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Anthony Avista Bisson. I'm an essayist for the website philosophyismagic.com. I write about politics, history, philosophy, and I occasionally write poetry and short stories. And I mostly am involved in other human rights activities as well on the side. So, yeah, that's a little bit quick on me. Okay, fair enough. Uh, Anthony, you wanted to bring uh, to light some of the struggles that uh, women are facing in that part of the world. So where mm -hmm. do you want to take us with this? Okay. So essentially I've come on here today to, I guess, raise awareness about a campaign that's going on for Saudi women in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Currently, um, Saudi women are protesting for an end to male guardianship law. And for all those who don't know what male guardianship law is, it's essentially in Saudi Arabia, women have to have male guardians. Inconceivable! And these male guardians have domination, you could say dominion over uh, their lives. So when it comes to their education, to their, their travel, to their basic rights, they're all, you could say, superseded by men. So men will have to uh, uh, ask for them to travel or allow them to travel, to work, to get an education, even to do basic operations. You need a male guardian, even to ask for emergencies, and even to drive. They can't drive in Saudi Arabia. And what's ca happened? Oh, sorry? No, so essentially you're saying that women cannot do absolutely anything out there in public unless they're accompanied by a male relative. Now who's responsible, I say, who's responsible for this unwarranted attack on my person? Yes, uh, because um, the, their identity as a human being is not recognized within Saudi Arabia. And what male guardians often do to their, you could say, to their female counterparts is that... Um, They'll abuse a lot of their women. And because of this, a lot of male guardians are, don't get, you could say, the proper justice that they need when they abuse their, their woman. And, and women don't get, you know, protection from their abuse. So what women have come onto social media to do is sort of to raise awareness of their suffering. And they're trying their best at the moment with a campaign called Stop Enslaving Saudi Women which is currently, it has a hashtag in Arabic, which I will not try to say, oh, but it's you. on its 100th day today, which you got me actually at a good time, because technically it's 101 days, my time, but it's 100 days. So it's been going on since June, and it's a campaign to try to raise awareness on social media and other parts as well about the system. So CNN um, and a couple other foreign media you could say have done um 
programs explaining what you know what the movement's about, what guardianship laws are about, and so on. And it's, it's just what what the aim of it is to is to try raise awareness of the plight of Saudi women and to try have some form of change to the system mm. to allow women basic rights and liberties. No, no. Yeah. As Anthony, you've studied the uh, the question of uh, Islam uh, a fair little bit yourself. Uh, yes, is this mm-hmm. is this really something that was tagged on to Islam, or is this something that's actually in the the, the uh, um, quote unquote holy text? Well, we all know that. Um, sort of, I should I should say that um, with Islam, Islam does justify, if you will, the clothing of women, or you could say the 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 d- dominion of men over women within Islam. However, with, when regards to Saudi Arabia, prior to the 1970s, the male guardianship law was much more laxed. So you would have women who would be able to drive in certain areas. It was not perfect because, again, this comes drags on, if you will, from a uh, history of Islam within the region and within the Middle East region as, as a whole. And there were cultural pressures on women to sort of bail here and there. But it was not at the same, you could say, extent as it is today. But it was not until the 1970s with um, political uprivals of Islamist groups within countries such as Iran and within Saudi Arabia that this changed. So, for example, in 1979, if I'm correct, um, um, a grand mosque was seized by a bunch of Islamists who thought that the country was going towards was being too westernized mm-hmm. because the prior kings, King um, Faisal and um, King Saud, had, you could say, allowed women certain privileges. So the ability to go to sort of schools here and there. And the country was going towards a westernization. However, the Islamists did not like that. So what they did is in 1979, a group of them seized a mosque. I renew my objection to this pointless endeavor. Informally now and by affidavit later. Time permitting. And there was a lot of blood, a lot of, um, co- um, you could say, destruction and what have you. And after the the perpetrators were captured and executed, the King Khalid gave more power to the religious conservatives because his solution to religious, you could say, uprising was to have more religion. So he allowed the religious conservatives and the ulema, which is the, like the head of them um, within the with, within Saudi Arabia and like that, to have more power. So the 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 religious police could enforce um, greater restrictions on women. They could force women to veil up and what have you. So yeah. So you're saying, hold on a sec. So you're saying this guy's his his idea of uh, problems caused by religion is was to install more religion. You yes, live I know it sounds ass. crazy, and that's what he did. He he gave more power, if you will, to the religious conservatives. Yeah. Wow, that's uh, pretty amazing thinking. There's a cognitive dissonance in there somewhere for sure. <laughs> okay, <laughs> you could say so. So so mm-hmm. so this this phenomenon of women being for lack of a better term, shackled to their male counterpart is uh, yep. relatively recent. Well, it's it's actually, it, you could say, yes, within Islam, that kind of attitude of, you know, subservient, sorry, sub, sub, you could say a submission towards males is, is it, it, it comes from Islam originally. However, within Saudi Arabia, the current laws, the current restrictions were given more power because of, you could say, the political uprisings of Islamists within the Middle Eastern region. And it's because of this, almost this fear by Islamists or very religious religious conservatives that the country was going towards, you know, infidel or kuffar nature. And it needs to be stopped away from that. So these, these groups or what they do is to enforce more religious law to stop that westernization because they're so afraid of the West, because they literally, for example, I'll, I'll take a, an example. On social media, I have I am with a bunch of other associates who are human rights lawyers and who are essentially from outside of Saudi Arabia. They view our involvement in the campaign as some Western conspiracy. They view it as people like myself as being a part of a 
a Western agenda with this movement. And because they view it like that, they can sometimes, like you have honestly you have um, a lot of the people who are against this movement who say that, oh, look, it's the West. Look what the West is doing. They're influencing this and they're trying to make our society more Westernized. You, you can't listen to them. And they try, you know, they try um, br- um brush off the whole movement because there's some foreigners who support it. Yeah, you but say. that's, I mean, that's, that's such a popular, I, I don't know whether popular is, but that's such a popular way to to dismiss um, things that are going on in your own, co- in your own country. You, you say, oh, it's the foreigners that are doing this, and that way you, you know, you, 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 you don't have to accept responsibility for, for the things that, that you're actually exactly. doing within the country. It's all their Fault and it uh, it's it's a power movement that is uh, is used too often and, and many times it works. You can't handle the truth. This weekend, I, wa- I, I just watched this little uh, documentary on Netflix. I think it's called Saudi Arabia Exposed, and it's really horrendous what you mm-hmm. actually see in this country. I mean, there's this scene where this guy's he's like a street musician. He's walking around with his lute, and he's stopped by the um, morality police, if you can call that the religious police, and mm-hmm. he's told you're yep. not going to play that in public, are you? Says, well, no, no. So he he just walks away for five minutes, and just like every freaking musician, sits on a corner and starts fiddling with his lute a bit. Well, they come around and they grab his lute and they break his lute and his finger. Oh. I mean, mm. how this is beyond just Western influence for for a guy to play music. That's not Western influence. That's just human nature. So I yeah. don't understand where this argument could come from. That it's all Western. Yeah, and the thing is, is that um, within Saudi Arabia, the government is very paranoid of losing its power, or losing its influence, and it cracks down severely on dissidents. I mean, we have one famous case of Raif Badawi, who was um, for simply writing against the government, sort of criticizing, if you will, the government, and not even criticizing much about Islam. He was imprisoned and sentenced to a thousand lashes, and he's still in prison today. And his um, wife, Ensaf Badawi, is doing work and trying to, if you will, try to get Raf Badawi out of jail for that. And just, that's just one example yeah, of her, many her, dissidents who are. His, his wife is actually right here in Canada in the province of Quebec in Sherbrooke. And uh, she's got uh, four kids. Uh, is it three or four kids? And they haven't seen her father in four years now. Mm. Uh, and, you know, yes. for her, with the struggle for her is to try to keep up the hope for the kids that they will see their father eventually before they actually can become adults. And uh, Rafe was uh, 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 given like 50 lashes of his 1,000 lashes. And yeah. he hasn't been, of course, it was terrible. 1,000 lashes, I don't think anybody can even survive something close to that. And he's been in prison ever since. So they, they've kind of put away the lashing right now, but he's still locked up over there for simply yeah, writing the, a blog. And, and the thing is, is that there was another activist um, who was an atheist who criticized religion and the state. And I can't, I, feel, I really wish I could remember the person's name but he was only 17 and he was executed he was um beheaded and it's, it's quite a sad thing that like i think it was 17 or 20 i, I must really I, I i someone has to double check me on that but i'll, I'll try to hopefully remember the name later and i'll try to sort of give it to you later but um i'm sure tyler's listening i'm sure he'll find a way to yeah <laughs> double but, check um, on you. This, this person was just so, to be so young and to die simply because you you don't believe in what your culture or what your government says is the truth. Because in Saudi Arabia, they put so much emphasis on, so recently on sort of uh, making sure you learn Islamic history, learning anything about Islam. And don't get me wrong that there are many Saudi women, actually the majority of Saudi women within this campaign are Muslim themselves. And there are some who who favor the system, and they're called um, dabours, if I'm not mistaken. It's a word that literally means someone who loves the system. They love to be, they love their male guardians. And then you also get women who are given the status of men within the media, for foreign media, to say how good the system within Saudi Arabia is. So they essentially, they're PR people. It's called um, Sak El, it's called Sak El Walahi. Yeah, I can't pronounce that in Arabic, but that's I think I've got the best pronunciation You're of that. You're still doing better than us. <laughs> yeah, but it's essentially when you allow um, women the same status as men, only on the condition that they make a positive image of Saudi Arabia. <laughs> so what they do is that they go to foreign media and they lie about the, the country and how good it is to women. And like, look at me, look, I can do this. Women love the system. 
the you know the propaganda pieces for the government. Wow, that's outrageous. That's outrageous. Yeah, I you know I I always wonder, especially when you, uh, around here, we, there's always a lot of questions about um, the headgear, the headwear, head jobs, and all that. And mm-hmm. you know, I I just I have a hard time. Frankly, I really do have a hard time understanding how all these women in Saudi Arabia are saying, oh, we just love wearing the hijab. Are you telling me of all the women in your country, not one of them says, you know what, I don't want to wear a hijab. And she's I mean, allowed? No, I, I really, I can't buy that. I just can't buy that 100% of all women in Saudi Arabia want to wear a hijab or a burqa or the, whatever else. And the, and the excuse is really about modesty culture. They come with the excuse that, you know, this is for modesty. You know, it's, it's for like women... Have uh, have this ability. They have this freedom to wear this this hijab or what have you. And it's all about you know keeping modesty and keeping you know within Islam. And look, it's it's, it's making me free. It's making me liberated. Look at me. When in reality, it's just it's a. If you know what it is, it's just an, a, another form of religious imposition. And it's very sad that some of these people have this like mentality that okay, this hijab represents liberty. When in reality, it, it doesn't. I mean, for whoa, example, I'll minute. give you a good, good wait, example. Whoa. Within um, Saudi Arabia, it used to be the case when Saudi Arabia used to have slavery. And by the way, slavery was only abolished within Saudi Arabia in 1962. Surely you can't be serious. I am serious. And don't call me Shirley. That's how, that's how, uh, that's when it was abolished. Yowch. But pro- 1962, yeah. wow. Yeah, and um, because it was only, it was only abolished because of international pressure. It's like Britain and other countries were like, guys, please stop your slavery. We don't like it. You've been having it too long. I mean, we got rid of our stuff like 200 years ago. Why you still have it? <laughs> but um, <laughs> as I was saying. Deb, you so, wanted to so, interject uh, here. A couple things come up because now we've, we've moved on to a comp- Completely different thought that I might have, but it, it, as far as as liberties and what someone is choosing to wear for themselves, right? Yeah. If they choose to wear a hijab, good on them. If they mm-hmm. choose to wear a bikini, good on them. Doesn't fit into their culture, that's their problem. But for me to sit on this side of the planet and look and say those people over there ought to be able to blah blah, or they should want to. That, I think, is just as much of an imposition of my thoughts on them as, as what we're assuming their religious or governmental standards are. Yeah, I would, I, I right? would agree with that. I, I, you, mm-hmm. you, they ought to be able to, I think is the correct way to say it. Right. But they yeah. ought to, that's, that's another thing. Right, but I hear a lot from, from this side of the planet where other cultures should want what I have. I have this freedom and they should want that freedom too. And I find that to be just as much of an imposition well, as <laughs> you're, you're free, I'll, right? I'll, you choose. And so for me to, I, th- I think that, you know, revolution comes from the inside. It doesn't come from the outside. Mm-hmm. So, well, and going back to what we, we were just touching on was um, this whole idea mm-hmm. about um, the slavery thing is, how did these other governments influence their government at that point in 1962 to abolish the slavery? How, how do we make a government uncomfortable enough to change their law for an entire country, mm-hmm. right? So, yeah. I, think, I, I just think quickly want to just to t- okay. I just want to touch that um, it used to be the case that in the, the old days, sort of like in prior to when slavery was still around within Saudi Arabia, it used to be the case that if you were wearing a veil, you were considered free, and those who weren't wearing a veil were considered slaves, and oh. slaves to the kuffar, or slaves to, you could say, the non-righteous way, if you will. And to me, honestly, is that I, I kind of, I take the position, I'm not a cultural relativist at all, or a, you could say a moral relativist, I'm, I, I assert that there are superior cultures and there are superior values that deserve, I guess, to be spread. And I guess that's just my position. But I do fervently believe that um, we, at least in the West, they, you, yes, you, they should be, have the ability to wear or wear not what they want. But I do believe that these individuals, it's not the case like in Iran or Saudi Arabia that they have this choice to wear what they want to wear with the hijab. Or like that. These things are mandated by the state and mandated, ma- mandated by cultural pressures. And these cultural pressures deny these women basic liberties or basic freedoms. And I know that they, you could say, okay, they, I guess it's their culture. Why should we judge their culture? Well, their culture is having a lot of suffering. And I do think if that's sort of like a litmus, it's not a litmus test, I mean, an a- analysis of that suffering is that it's 
overall, it's not good for the society, and therefore one should do something to change that. Mm-hmm. At least that's from my opinion. Okay, well, let me play, go, uh, let me play uh, devil's advocate here for a sec, because I love doing that. Now, you, we were mm-hmm. talking about ought, ought to or should be able to. Um, mm-hmm. So uh, let me let me throw a wrench here. What if what if we say, for example, that we do have the numbers here that prove that the secular society is actually more productive and more prone to better human development? Would that mm-hmm. give us the right to be a bit more forceful on their culture? Um, the devil's advocate here. Influential or forceful? Well. Would, would that give us a, bi- a bigger stick to uh, whack them b- over the head? And then it backs right? up um, to my previous comment on how does one government influence another government? How do you make them uncomfortable enough, right? So influence, you can't force. You cannot force. That just creates, well, right? You can, you can deny them to play in your sandbox and, and benefit from your... Well, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to do that in a global economy, right? Like it or not, so mm. that was that was just. Is, is that because you need from them? <laughs> well, you can't maybe. get what you need from them from anywhere else. Well, see, considering they're sitting on the biggest oil reserve in the world, I guess so. Well, then mm. I, going right back to an earlier discussion about the our right. our yeah our Anthony Carey well, well, oil. Well, the, well, the thing is, is that well, I'll just maybe take I guess Saudi Arabia for example. People have the notion that Saudi Arabia, because they have oil, oil, and that they have power, I guess, over the United States or what have you. And where that may be true, yes, but I do think that, you know, the United States has a lot of influence over Saudi Arabia, conversely, because, for example, the Saudi Arabia is afraid of Iran, and it's been afraid of um, Iran's growing relation with the United States. And because of that, it's sort of like its attitudes can be changed, because I think really that there's a bunch of ways you can really influence how a how a country operates or whatever you can do it militarily you can do it through sanctions you can do it through culture you can do it through there's a number of ways you can do it and it's sort of almost like you know multi-prong effect or as to say i would rather prefer a cultural sort of influence where you sort of have a grassroots movement coming up where you sort of like inspire those within the society to take up their own and to sort of change their own society without necessarily having to go in yourself this, there are some cases, like there are some war hawks that I know, like some neocons I talk to, who are very gun ho on the notion of we should just go in this country and go guns are blazing, do democracy. And we know that, that that's, that's very naive and sort of doesn't always work. But I am of the approach that, you know, it needs a multi-prong approach should be taken. So there must be not only a grassroots movement, but there should be some, you could say, um, pressure internationally, either through sanction or through sanctions or preventing them to doing this or that it's those kind of things i don't i think the military option if anything should be a lost approach and that's a really a lost approach hmm. that's sort of that that what differs me from my i guess my neocon friends yeah that's a joke son don't you get it i made a funny son and you're not laughing <laughs> but yeah i hope i hope that i was not waffling on about something else <laughs> no 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 but do, do you feel anthony that with uh, especially with the advent of social media I mean, as I know in Saudi Arabia, you're not even allowed to film, but everybody has an iPhone today, even down there. Yeah. I mean, it, yeah. it, it, they just, they're just not going to be able to hold back the tide of s- social media and new technologies. Don't you think it's a it, losing battle for them? Yeah, yeah it, exactly. A lot of um, Saudi women have, they, they have technology. They're not like in the Stone Age. They have their technology. They have their phones. They have their, their smartphones, iPhones. However, what the government does is it simply censors websites like YouTube, censors your ability to call out outside of the government via Skype or WhatsApp and what have you. However, a lot of them use Twitter, which is actually quite interesting. Twitter is one of the main avenues, if you will, for women to sort of speak their mind. They, of course, they don't use their real names because the government – the government, if they know you have your real name, they can actually, you know, take you to a court and they can put you before the court. They look what you're doing on social media. You shouldn't be doing that. We're going to put you in a what, what's it? A care house. They call it a care house. It's actually not really a care house. It's sort of like a house that's a jail cell, if you will. That's for care of your of your woman or well, whatever. You've obviously which lost is your mind rubbish. and you need a little help with that, right? Yeah, wow, yeah. that's bad. We do this yeah. to our seniors here. <laughs> Well, Anthony, do you do you see do you see that 
within the the government or within the the male structure in Saudi Arabia, do you see any hope? that um, any of the men, you know, are, are becoming a little, you know, m- more liberal or lenient? Or do you think it's all lockstep and it's going to take a, a, a revolution rather than an enlightenment of the, the ruling class? To use a, I hate to use that, well, but it's the only thing that comes to mind. But do you think it's going to take a, a revolution rather than enlightenment or that well, enlightenment stands a chance? Well, I think that I, I've had a lot of debates with a lot of Saudi women most of them are really – they just want to do it through a sort of a, a grassroots kind of movement. But there are some radicals who say we should get up arms and do something about it. And I say to them that, okay, if you want that to be the case – and I, I, do, I do agree with a little bit of radicalism. But I also have to say that, you know, the government cracks down quite harshly on protests. Like, it, for example, I think it was in 2012. Of the government cracked down on a protest, like a peaceful protest by killing a bunch of people, which is not very good. But as I say, to sort of address your, I uh, guess, um, your question a little bit uh, more, I think that, you know, there are men within the system that are actually helping. I mean, there's a lot of men who are who have who are male guardians themselves who actually take good care of their, you know, their, their daughter or like that, who can see, oh, look, this is my, this is a wrong system. I'm going to do what I can to help. And there's a lot of women Sorry, a lot of men who are are helping as well. Now, the royal family did. The royal family has a different set of rules. Like it says the, to the public eye, to the West, it says like, look, we're this you know the strong Islamic, um, uh, how you could say Islamic royal family. When in reality, they have different rules for their prince, princesses and princes. They've got different rules completely for the hierarchy because the hierarchy don't aren't, if you will, necessarily submissive to the religious laws or, you know, to the strict laws, because they're the royal family. They can do not everything. I won't say it because I don't know for certain, but I know that they have much more rights than basic sort of Saudi women. And the thing is, is that it's mostly the religious conservatives who have a grasp of the country. So the lemmas and the mullahs and like that, they have a grasp over the country. And they are very, they are the ones that are very reactionary, who sort of, who bully, if you will. The prince and princes and like that, and the king himself and like that. For example, King, um, not King Abdullah, the recent King Salem, I think it's Salem, Solomon, sorry, King Salman recently is that the recent king, because the King Abdullah died in 2015. Yes. King Salman is is quite a different kind of king, because King Abdullah allowed um, for 30 women to get on the council of, um, I think it was the, not religious council, but council within the government and it was only it was the first i guess you could say one of the major strikes but that was mostly for um western influences you know for the west to say oh look they, they're having progress when in reality they're not really but i do think that there's optimism just to get really back to the question i do think that there is optimism i do think that the system will change whether it be natural progression which i think that natural progression is quite slow i think that needs to be a little bit speeded up and i do think that international community needs to put a little bit more pressure on Saudi Arabia in order for them to at least change their laws, not like change an overall change of the system, but change the current law of male guardianship. Yeah. So, so Anthony, in, in conclusion for all of our listeners that are listening right now, what would you recommend the average person does to help with this situation? What I would recommend the average person does, and I want to just, um, before I guess um, conclude, I want to read out one story before I just, I'm going to give references and then I'm going to read the story if that's okay. Yeah. Um, so I would recommend individuals to get educated on the subject. And I would recommend them go to Human Rights Watch. They've got a lot of great articles on um, the, the suffering of um, Saudi women. And sort of one of them is called Boxed In. And I'll, 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 pro- I'll provide links to um, Kevin a little bit later. And the thing is, is that I would also ask them to take part if they have, if they have a Twitter account or if they have some social media accounts, raise awareness, if you will, of just what women are going through in the country and raise, raise awareness of the system. Because a lot of people in the West don't even know what's happening in King of Saudi Arabia or don't care. And I know a lot of them will say, why should we care? And I say that, you know, they are your fellow human beings. You are on the same planet and you have at least some obligation as a, if, even as a humanist to do something to help your fellow creature. And I feel that, you know, this may be a very small thing to help with, but raising awareness does a lot, and it raises awareness to the cause that's currently going through. And if, Kevin, if, if it's okay, can I read out a, a letter a woman sent me, or do you want to add something? By all means, go for it. Yeah. 
By all means, go for it. Okay. Okay, I'm going to change this woman's name. I'm going to change to Aisha because I can't reveal her actual name for security reasons. But um, so here goes the letter. <clears throat> My name is Aisha. I am a 23. 23- Three old woman who comes from the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Before I tell of my experiences living here, I wish to say just one sentence, and I want you to read this sentence carefully. When you are born a girl in KSA, you will feel that the only crime that you have committed is being born into the wrong sex. Let me explain why it is a crime to be a girl in KSA. Since I was five years old, I knew what the difference was between a girl and a boy. You see, I have a brother. When I was five years old, I was arguing with my brother, who was at the time three years old. The argument was over food. I told my brother to not throw food on the floor unless he did not want to eat it. It is wrong to, uh, to, to do otherwise. However, my brother did not listen to me and continued to throw food on the floor. It was in that moment that my father entered the room after hearing me arguing with my brother. He beat me with his hands. Why did he do this? Because my brother was a boy and can do what he wants. And I am a girl and have to respect whatever my brother does, even when he is wrong. I remember having to cry in my grandmother's room after that. It was so wrong. As I grew, I noticed more and more the differences in the way that my parents treated me as opposed to how they treated my other sibling brothers. Boys could go out with their friends, but I could not. Boys could take money and go out freely, but I could not. Boys could sleep where they wanted, but I could not. I noticed that whenever my brothers went out with friends, they never had to be accompanied by my father. However, whenever I went out, I had to be accompanied by either my brothers or my father. I felt like a prisoner who had to be accompanied 24-7 by a guard. Or for being born into the wrong sex. It is not my fault for being born a girl by my mother. When I asked my mother about why my brothers could get to do more things than me, she told me that it was because they were better than me. In other words, boys are better than girls. Brothers are better than daughters. She told me that I was nothing without a male. Your brothers can drive and bring things that we need, but girls cannot. I felt so much shame when she told me this. I felt that I was nothing. I felt that I was cursed. The very fact that my mother could say that as if it were nothing made me feel so hopeless. As the years went on, more and more beatings occurred by my father and even by my brothers. It was only when I graduated from high school that I decided to change this. I decided to do all that I can to be independent, to show my family that even if I am a girl, I can do many things that boys can do. I can still be a successful person, even without their support. When I, when I told them that I wanted to study medicine or nursing at college, they laughed at me. My father and mother did not believe that I could be successful at this. However, I did not care about them because they mean nothing for me. I believe in myself. The next day, I registered into my local university. However, I still have to give my father all the money the university pays for me to allow me to study. Because if I refuse, then he will not allow me to study and he will beat me. The first year of nursing was so difficult. I had to learn English language because my course was mainly taught in English. None of my parents are educated and my father did not allow me to have a private teacher even when I offered to use my own money. He cared more about money than he does about me. However, despite the difficulties brought before me, I managed to persevere and I worked hard to learn English, as well as complete my nursing course. I did all things to achieve high grades and it paid off. For once, I felt so happy. I did achieve some form of small victory. I graduated from nursing college with very high grades and I wanted to study abroad. I wanted to get a scholarship, but my father said no. He said it so easily. I felt that I lost hope. I became pessimistic. All my dreams in my mind were destroyed because my male guardian said no. Now I feel, whenever I wake and whenever I sleep, as if my body does not have a soul. 
I cannot study, I cannot work, I cannot marry, I cannot go to the hospital, I cannot pay anything, I cannot visit friends without a male guardian. I am a slave that is forced to be chained for life. Some of my friends have accepted this reality, but I do not want to accept it. I want to break my chains and break my bondage. I want to breathe freely. I want to be free. I want to live my own life, be my own person, all because I am a girl. Now you know what I mean by when you are born a girl in KSA, you will feel that the only crime that you have committed is being born to the wrong sex. I am forced to love someone I hate. However, I am not the only one. There are many like me in my country, many women who suffer as I do. We want our freedom from this tyranny. We want the male guardian system to end. This is my wish. My name is Aisha. I am just another woman who lives in KSA. Wow. That's very powerful. That is a that's a that's a powerful and sad letter. It's 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 so sad. It's and but she is she is a, a, a spokeswoman for for her for her sisters, for yes, her counterparts yes, for yes. sure. I uh yeah. wow, thank you so much for that letter, Anthony. It's um I, I sure hope our listeners take some time to realize that, mm-hmm. you know, here in the West we kinda take a bit for granted what we have. You know, and um, that maybe by reaching out more to our brothers and sisters in those countries, that maybe we can encourage them to get out of that trap, that religious trap of theirs. Yeah. Do you have that letter published on your uh, on on Facebook, or is that just a private letter well, that was sent? And thank you so much for sharing it orally with us. Oh, well, th- well, thank you. Um, I have to. I was going to publish it with. Um, if you will, an article, because I'm at the moment, I'm writing an article, if you will, on the male guardian system. I'm sort of, I want to plan on sort of releasing hopefully somewhere time in November. But if, if I want to, I could actually release that letter on its own. But the thing is, is I want to write an context, article yeah. and include a bunch of the stories that Saudi women send me. Because I am, I, I am along with about three other translators because I can't speak Arabic. So they translate me the letter, and what I do is sort of I kind of edit it to make it sort of palpable to an English audience. Mm-hmm. So with that letter, that you could see it had a little bit of a little bit high English. I had, there was a little bit of editing on my own part because I had to make sort of it palpable to English audiences. But most of the genuineness is within there. And it's uh, it's her words. I just simply organize them for her to have her voice to come out of. Yeah. People. Yeah. Well, make it avail- if if you can, Anthony. We'd love to well, have you make it available to us. And well, if it we'll, doesn't we'll make the letter available, at least make the yeah. uh, the link to your blog available. Exactly. So when it does come out, people can yeah. actually read it right for themselves. And we'll post that in the notes of the show. That's where I was going. Not just the mm-hmm. letter, but you know the article and and so forth, because it's very powerful. And if we can reach some more people who, as we talked about before, will become more aware of what's going on outside their own four walls, I think that would be. That would be a step forward and and answers um, Kevin's question is, what can we do? Well, this is one thing that we can do. So if people want to reach you, Anthony, and find out more about your blog, where can they reach Mm -hmm. you? They can reach me at um, philosophyismagic.com. That's my website. And if they want to find me on Facebook, they just have to go Anthony Avis de Bisson. And if they want to follow me on Twitter or if they want to, I guess, contact me via Twitter. My handle is Stoic Viper. So Okay. I'll, I'll send of course links to all that stuff to you, Kevin. I appreciate that and we'll put yeah. that in the notes of the show. Thank you so much, Anthony, for all this. I really appreciate it. Oh, it was a delight to have you and we hope you join us many more many more times. We learned so much from you, Anthony. Thanks so much for oh, being with us. Thank you. Become a regular. It, it was nice it was nice talking to you all. And we should do it again sometime as well. We certainly <laughs> will. And that was Anthony Avis Dubrisson. What a powerful, powerful story about the plight of women in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Absolutely. I mean, we, we, we do a lot of goofiness in this show, but this, this was quite serious. And I'm, I'm kind of glad. And, uh, it is the the more awareness the the the, the better we are. I mean, we may not be able to influence or do anything, but um, who knows? Eventually, you know, there may be someone who's listening that uh, can have some influence. You never know what yeah. knowledge well, what knowledge will bring. So remember when we great. went to uh, Vancouver, we went to speak to Hem and Meta. Well, you were with us, right? Yeah. And uh, one of the speakers 
for the Atheist Republic. Uh, was it Fas- uh, Faisal Saeed Al Mutar? I think. Right. He was talking about you know one of the things that you can do is befriend these people. You know, um, making their Facebook friends. You know, you see the little atheist symbol, even though the name's in Arabic, well, why not send them a friend request or Twitter or something like that? Talk to these people. And, you know, you're an atheist out here and you're out in the open. You give courage to these people out there that are facing huge uh, issues. And you're giving them courage because one of the big things as an atheist is you have to realize that you're not alone. In, yeah, in this, and that's part of being human. I mean, that's part of being human is to you know is to be able to connect in ways that you know in, in influence all in, in in a positive way. Mm-hmm. And um, that wonderful suggestion, if it's possible to to befriend, let's do it. Absolutely. Top of my right. Have you ever gone to one of these races where you team up with a partner, tied together, like a three-legged race? Sure, it's fun and pretty hilarious to see Uncle Bob trip and fall flat on his face, but what lesson can we derive from this? If you answered cooperation, congratulations, you paid attention in school. Lesson is that if you cooperate with your partner and run in some matter of sync, you'll make it to the finish line. This three-legged race can be a great metaphor for our own life. There is no guarantee that you'll make it to a finish line and claim a prize, so why in hell would we purposely trip our own partner? Women, who compromise 50% of all humans. It's like managing to kick down or trip the partner you have in a three-legged race. Not only is it going to make that race to the finish line all the more difficult if you have to drag the partner, but imagine doing this stupid thing because you believe some desert Iron Age goat herder told you it was the best way to win the race. How stupid would you feel? Yet, in the 21st century, millions, if not billions of people, still do this to women all over the world. They are not only diminishing their chance of ever finishing the race, they are completely ignoring the huge contribution women have brought to humanity over the years. But then again, what can you expect from a book that recommends sheep herding as an ambition, desert spirits, and bumbling to the floor for inspiration? The story of humanity was never about conquest or boundaries. It was always about potential and the exploration of the unknown. If we choose to listen to horrible ancient texts sprouted from the mind of small men who dream of military might and ignore an entire gender and her potential, we might as well give up this race called life. We cannot win. But if we sink our efforts with our partners, we have a much better chance of crossing that finish line not just as men or women, but as humanity. That takes us to the end of our show. Thank you so much, for, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us. And thank you, ladies, here in the studio. So welcome. Always fun. Great show, as per usual. You can always reach us on uh, leftofthevalley.com. You can find us on Facebook, on Twitter, and I will post up the links for finding out more about what Anthony Evis Dubuisson does, the great work he does. Coming up, we have uh, next week, we should have the Satanists. This should be interesting. Just in time for Halloween, and of course, we'll have our Halloween special with our friends from uh, uh, Legion of Reason, Randy Tyson and Christine, to join us. That should be fun. We'll be telling ghost stories around the campfire. In November, we have our friend Arn Raw. He'll be joining us. He's talking about his uh, new book that just came out. We'll be talking about ancient aliens. We'll also have uh, atheists from uh, Facebook, Damien Mary at home. We got a lot of good stuff yeah, coming up. We Holy, great, to, to, we're on a roll. Till the end of the year, we got a great, great schedule. Uh, we'll have a debate: uh, Chris, uh, Christian versus an atheist on the history of Jesus. That should mm-hmm. be fun. We'll be talking about Saint Paul with our friend David Fitzgerald. Can't wait for that one. Yeah. And then, of course, we'll have our Christmas special. Thank you so much, ladies. Any last word? Because this was really a woman-centric show. No, stay tuned for all the good stuff. Don't miss a show. (laughs) Regardless of what you're doing, don't miss the show. (laughs) Very tug-in-cheek here. Pray for America. We're about to go through this election one way or another. Good, Good luck. 
<laughs> Good luck, Deb. Thank you. <laughs> and you already voted, Nancy, so. I did. You, you, I you're kind of on the safe side. You're on the north of the 49th. And the, the last debate is coming up this week, too. Oh. Uh. I need some Pepto Bismol. Again. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, ladies. Until next time. I'm proud to be an atheist, a skeptic, a non believer, an infidel, a heathen. I call it how I see it. I say it's ignorance, and you just call it faith and unsubstantiated claims. That's something to be ashamed. I'm an atheist. Atheist, atheist. I'm an atheist. Let me take a sec, don't mean to sound so hateful But I swear to God, pun intended, I find it disgraceful The thousands of children are raped by priests And since they're holy men of God, they get away scot-free And the Pope does his very best to keep it on the hush Don't wanna affect business, he loves money too much We know that they love the kids, but how the fuck can we protect them While they planning to molest them, we teaching them to respect them Respect them that. The system is broke down, working backwards in the only action of tactic I plan to practice now is to attack them. The parties of God's hands are bloodstained, millions of murders by believers, and they're all in God's name. And let me take a sec, don't mean to sound so hateful, but I swear to God, unintended, I find it disgraceful. That many atheists are told to be quiet, you're not alone, speak your mind, time to let it be known. I'm proud to be an atheist, a skeptic, a non-believer, an infidel, a heathen, I call it how I see it. I say it's ignorance and you just call it faith and unsubstantiated claims, that's something to be ashamed. I'm an atheist, 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 I'm an atheist, atheist, atheist.